Потом что мам здесь. Моя мама. You здесь. Папа. Thank you for loving me. Bye. Finding the right jeans is hard. Accepting your jeans is even harder. Whether you wear boyfriend or boot cut, high rise or low rise, this podcast will teach you to love the jeans you are in. I'm Rachel. And I'm Tina. And we're going to use modern research to bust diet myths and get real about body after baby. We're going to take you on a journey of unpacking your old beliefs about food and weight so you can learn to nourish your body and raise body confident kids. So put your booty in a chair and let's talk mom jeans. Welcome to Mom Jeans. Today we are shifting the myth busting focus from the mom bod or the parent bod to the kid bod. And we are Ooh. busting the myth that da, 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 <laughs> kids today aren't eating enough healthy foods. We know that one of the biggest stressors on parents today is how to feed their children. So we are going to give you some of our thoughts about how this myth developed and became so pervasive. And then we are welcoming pediatric nutrition experts from Sunny Side Up Nutritionists to help shed even more light on this myth and help us bust it open even more. The subtle way that diet culture has gotten mixed up in health science is best explained through the term healthism, which was coined by Robert Crawford, defined in the 1980s as the preoccupation with personal health as a primary focus for the definition and achievement of well-being, a goal which is to be attained primarily through the modifications of lifestyles. Health, simply put, has become a primary goal and value for humanity and is the marketing slant put on nutrition, beauty products and services, alternative medicines, and even multi-level marketing companies telling you to buy from small companies. While health is important and nutrition does have an impact on our development, growth, and bodily functions, this hyper preoccupation for the financially privileged and the judgment of lack of health that is projected onto those who do not have access to a variety of vitamins, oils, minerals, lotions, kale, or smoothies (laughs) impacts this narrow definition of health. Yeah, I mean... Face it, feeding our children becomes our primary goal as soon as the child is born. Like they wipe it off, they clean it off, and you feed it, right? So it's natural that parenting begins with this obsession of how, what, and how much our children are eating. I mean, remember that whiteboard in the hospital room that is like, when was their last wet diaper? When was their first bowel movement? Like how much ounces do they take in? Like this obsession when you're like in this postpartum hormonal phase Boom, there it is. It becomes ingrained. And feeding our baby is also a form of attachment bonding for both the child and parent. And a parental instinct absolutely takes over when we suddenly become insanely preoccupied with our children's input and output. So this natural survival instinct ignited in parents combined with a culture obsessed with health and beauty and longevity makes the perfect recipe for wanting to be perfect in how we feed our children. The most common ways that we hear this myth expressed to us in our parenting circles, on the internet, reported in news circuits, and even in our school systems is, kids today aren't getting accurate nutrients. There are concerns about the processed foods that children are intaking, the amount of sugar in food and drinks that kids are consuming, and the intense frustration when kids won't eat their fruits and veggies. There are entire podcasts, books, and social media accounts helping parents get their quote-unquote picky eaters to eat, how to disguise or expose more vegetables to kids, and tips on how to involve your children in the kitchen in order to get them to understand the value of nutrition. There is an entire industry based on this myth. And while we are not saying that any of this is not important, we recognize that nutritional deficits in malnourished children are highly real and concerning and family mealtime is important to helping kids develop a great relationship with food we truly believe that parents and as a result kids are way too stressed out about food and nutrition and fear-mongering children to eat their fruits and veggies 
is not the way to develop a healthy eater. Yeah, we notice the theme and the day-to-day examples we hear surrounding this myth are based in shame and fear. And shame and fear are exactly what sells products and services. So as you'll hear today in our interview, the main producers of this myth are corporations or organizations that most likely have something to promote or sell if we buy into this myth. The studies that are based on this myth also are not accurately conducted or reported because most are from studying a general population and then pretend to be advice for individuals. In fact, the founders of the amazing organization Be Nourished unpack this myth in relation to the Mediterranean diet by calling it out for skipping over the last piece of data. The entire evidence of this diet is that it, quote unquote, reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. But they leave out this part of the sentence, but only if you are rich or highly educated. That was dead in 2017. So anyway, lots of different correlations, not causations in most of these studies. So this is a perfect example because on the news, we often hear about the results of studies without being informed that these results are based on a specific population and not inclusive of all ages, socioeconomic status, or personal history. In working with parents that are concerned about their children's intake, I find that it is mostly the parents worried that that they are not doing a good job or are projecting their own insecurities about food or their bodies onto their kids. So as a result, they pressure their children to eat a certain amount, eat specific foods, disregard their internal cues and preferences, and monitor their kids' bodies. What we are hoping for y'all to get out of this episode today is trust. Trust in yourself as parents, but mainly trust in your children. That eventually, when they are 18 years old and leave the house, they will have developed the skill of body trust and intuition. From there, they will be able to continue to develop skills into adulthood, which will empower their value of health. Should we bust this myth? All right, let's do it. Woo! All right, so we're going to introduce you to the two dietitians of Sunny Side Up Nutrition that we are interviewing today. Elizabeth Davenport is a registered dietitian and co-owner of Piney Davenport Nutrition in Washington, D.C. Elizabeth received her Master of Public Health and Nutrition from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and previously worked at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Before going to grad school, Elizabeth cooked professionally. She still loves to cook and share her love of food and cooking with others. She specializes in working with clients with eating disorders and childhood feeding. She is joined by Anna Lutz, a registered dietitian and certified eating disorder registered dietitian with a thriving private practice in North Carolina. Anna received her Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Duke University and Master of Public Health and Nutrition from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Aside from her one-on-one work with clients, Anna is a national speaker and delivers workshops and presentations on eating disorders, weight-inclusive healthcare, and childhood feeding. Together, they write and create resources about simple cooking, nutrition, and family feeding, free of diet culture, at Sunny Side Up Nutrition. They're also co-hosts of the Sunny Side Up Nutrition podcast. All right, let's hear what they have to say today. All right, well, we are super excited to be interviewing some amazing nutritionists from Sunny Side Up. So thank you so much for joining us and helping us bust the myth today that kids just, they're not eating healthy enough and we have to make them eat their vegetables and we have to help guide their healthy choices. So thank you so much for helping us come bust this myth today. Thank you for having us. So could you start us off by telling us a little bit about who you are and why you're passionate about busting this myth? I'm Anna Lutz. I'm a registered dietitian and I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I co-own a private practice. And I also am the co-creator of Sunnyside Up Nutrition with Elizabeth, who um, is here today. And, you know, I, I hear this myth all the time. And what I really think about is um, why has our culture narrowed down this definition of what healthy is? You know, it's this very narrow definition. Um, and we see it in these very black and white terms. And really, we need to be zooming out and um, defining health in a different way. And I think the more parents can do that and really look at health in a broad way, the more that we can kind of bust this myth and get away from it. Love that answer, Anna. Um, I'm Elizabeth Davenport. I'm also a registered dietitian. And I also co-own a uh, group practice. My, the group practice I own is in Washington, DC. And 
Anna, as Anna said, she and I um, write Sunny Side Up nutrition blog, and then we uh, co-host the podcast with another, um, with an RD to be, who actually was an intern of mine. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So um, I love Anna's answer to your question, and I think uh, to add to that, really one of the reasons um, that it's important, that I think it's important to bust this myth is, myth is that it creates so much stress and pressure around food that's really unnecessary and it complicates the, um, it, com it prevents kids from being able to do their jobs um, and it prevents the parents from really being able to do their job of feeding their kids. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I love the idea of zooming out, right? Where so often people are looking at food as a day-to-day, -day, week to week, and that's not how our true health is defined. It's over a long period of time, uh, long-term habits, the relationship we hold with all these factors. And so I love the idea of like, okay, let's zoom out. Let's look at our health as a puzzle. And food is one of the puzzle pieces. It is not the entire puzzle. Plus, kids are so I irrational <laughs> that if we're telling them, oh, hey, yes, this is good, this is bad, they literally are going to take it to the exact extreme and be like, this is why diet culture, I think, exists because parents are projecting and kids are inhaling that and then they're growing up and then regurgitating that information. And that's not why diet culture exists. But you get what I'm saying. And, you know, it just kind of we re keep reliving this kind of irrational cycle. Yes. So, I think that's so amazing. true. I think that's so true. And and, you know, it just makes me honestly it makes me so sad for our children. Like, why do they deserve for us to project all this onto them when, as we all know, kids are born intuitive eaters for the most part. You know, they want to explore new new foods, some more than others, some are slower at, than others. But what if we um, stopped projecting this narrow defi definition of health and really focused on the modeling, which is something I know you all talk about and so do we. So what do you know about this myth's history or origination? You know, Anna and I chatted a little bit about this beforehand, um, and I did a little bit of research to make sure <laughs> that my memory was correct. <laughs> it's been a long time since I was in yeah. school, grad school. Um, but, but oh. um, you know, some of it is from really the dietary guidelines, right? The recommendations for um, the amounts of fruits and vegetables that we eat. So food by food guide pyramid, my plate. Um, and those are important because the dietary guidelines are important because they are responsible for informing um, child food programs. And, and um, so we need that information, right? I think it gets um, taken over and misused by the media and people, not to criticize people who are developing nutrition education, but um, nutrition education and just society in general. And I also think um, programs like uh, Five a Day that was, I think it was developed in the 90s by the National Cancer in Institute and the um, Produce for Better Health Foundation. And yes, there's nothing wrong with promoting health, you know, promoting eating fruits and vegetables. We all know they're great for us, but I think some of these things are, are presented in, as Anna said earlier, in such an all or nothing way that it's hard. To, it, it creates a ton of pressure that if you're not doing this, if you're not, if your kid's not eating or you're not eating X amount, then you are doing a bad job and you're not a good parent. So I'm curious if, if that's, if that's the answer you're looking for or, or what else there is. <laughs> no, that was awesome. I'm just thinking, Elizabeth. You know what Elizabeth's talking about is these things that are created for population change, and then we we take them and we apply them, you know, to an individual, and it just doesn't work, right? It just isn't the. It's not how it's intended. It creates, um, as Elizabeth said earlier, fear and pressure and shame, and we know that the feeding relationship 
you know, the relationship between the caregiver and the child um, is best if those things don't exist, right? Like that shame and fear really erode that feeding relationship. And all these rules that have numbers and um, are so black and white really gets in the way of a child learning to eat more fruits and vegetables, learning to not be stressed out about food, having that positive relationship um, with food in their body overall. I feel like this is like, so Rachel, you're a little outnumbered here because we have uh, three dietitians, one intern sitting in on this. And so uh, to become a dietitian. That's okay. Give me all of the advice, everybody. I'll take it all in. But I feel like what we learned in school was like, okay, here are these guidelines. It's written down on a piece of paper. And then you're supposed to literally regurgitate that to people. And that is going to promote change. People are going to be healthy from this information. And then you recognize like, (laughs) that's actually the crappiest counseling (laughs) I've ever learned. Right. And like, that's not how people work. And so then the mojo of our counseling comes in and like how do we take this information as dietitians and mix it up in our brain and communicate it to individuals in the true way of health versus just regurgitating stuff on paper and that's why we are dietitians that's why we went to school for this so that we can take this information that is complicated that is more involved than just following x amount of number of servings per day and that we teach our clients and the population this information um Otherwise, everyone would be dietitians, everyone would be nutritionists. And I totally get that, like, you know, you'll see that person or hear meet this new person and they're like, oh, like, yeah, I'm a nutrition expert. Right. And you're like, I don't even tell people what I do because I don't want to get in the fight. Right. I don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) That's my that's my little tangent. Okay, what about for all of us non dietitian parents? (laughs) who are saying, but what if my kid won't eat the fruit and vegetables? Like, are they going to be okay? And how do you then see all of this messaging about the pressure for kids to eat healthy and to have this food pyramid and this food plate? How do you see that then being harmful to both the parents and the kids? Well, one thing I want to make sure we point out first, hopefully this will decrease some of the pressure is when these recommendations are just kind of spat out, right? You know, each child needs to have five fruits and vegetables a day. The serving sizes for children are quite small. And there might be a meal, your child eats 10 servings of fruits and vegetables just at that one meal, but then they don't eat any for the next, you know, three or four. Um, So that's just something to keep in mind that I like to talk to parents about. You know, I go back to thinking when my daughter was a toddler, she loved blueberries, and she would eat a, a nice pint of blueberries. That's, that's a lot of servings of um, fruit because servings for, for young children are quite small. So that's just kind of, a, that's part of that zooming out, right? Like we can be so specific, five fruits or vegetables. Well, what does that mean? Um, but to more directly answer your question, you know, I really, I really like to talk about parents, to talk to parents about um, decreasing the pressure and anxiety at meals and that we know that um, again that pressure doesn't lead to children eating um, more of a variety so if that's our goal let's kind of say well if our goal is to have an adult child who eats a variety of food that includes fruits or vegetables what is the best way to achieve that goal and the, the, the research really shows it's through modeling. So it's through the parents eating those foods. It's through offering without pressure, offering a variety of foods at set meal and snack times. Um, and it's about not demonizing certain foods and kind of morally elevating other foods, kind of really talking neutrally about it, to learn, you know, teaching young children where food comes from. You know, I like to play a game with my children is this does this grow in a bush or does it grow in a tree, right? Like, let's just kind of wonder about that. Or does it grow under the ground? Those are the kind of things we could be talking to kids about rather than eat this or you're going to get sick or eat this because it's quote unquote healthy. 
Right, and I would add to that, that, that the offering, when we, by offering, we mean just make it available, right? You, whether it's putting the fruit or vegetables on their plate or, or letting them serve themselves, but offering, at the, offering doesn't mean saying, here, have this, here, try this, <laughs> here, yum, yum, I love straw, you know, try, offering doesn't mean um, trying to coerce them into, mm -hmm. into yeah, eating. Yeah, literally them. just means putting it on the plate and zipping the lip, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's hard. Right. Which is so hard. Mm -hmm. It's so hard, right? And these, I mean, I'll say, I was thinking about this earlier, I, you know, I know all this, right? I've been teaching people this for years. And even when I was just thinking and, and reading back on the, the history of the dietary guidelines, which actually there's a really interesting, um, uh, it's not an article, but I'll send it to you guys in case you're interested. But I started thinking, oh my gosh, wait, am I feeding my kids enough fruits and vegetables, right? Of course I am. But just even reading the information made me question you know, my question, what I'm doing. So there's just the pressures everywhere. I and, know. And why is health information so based in fear, right? Like that, that article had to have some fear strung through it to make you feel that way. And it just logically makes so, no sense. We're not going to scare people into being healthy. That makes no sense. Right. Right. And actually fear, you know, like that's where like that's creating more stress. And if we're talking about this whole picture of health, it's like, let's work on emotional health, too, and kind of take that added pressure off because that added pressure is ultimately creating more stress in your life. And that is not awesome. <laughs> well, I think that I'm wondering if Elizabeth's points about the history of this myth go back to being able to identify where the fear comes from. I mean, if you're looking at who's developing a lot of these guidelines, you're looking at a cancer society, a produce, a corporation, you know, different places that are now going to benefit financially off of your fear. So I think that's potentially where a lot of the fear develops. I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that. I agree. Yeah, yeah, it is a good point. I mean, and if you look at the dietary guidelines and, and the, um, you know, yes, they're, they're developed um, with uh, input from scientists um, and they're evidence-based. They also get input from lobbyists. I don't think so it's a neutral think... source that's delivering our information. We'll put it that way. <laughs> no. No. The therapist in me wants <laughs> to go back to the anxiety and the stress piece as well. I think it's so hard for parents to let go of this fear-based thinking around health because of our own rigidity and our own black and white thinking, potentially going back to the family diet legacy that we're so passionate about busting, where that comes from, um, and our own anxiety that gets in the way. But I think what I want to point out, especially as someone who works with eating disorders, anxiety messes with your hunger and fullness cues. And we see so many eating disorders developed because of the mental health components towards food and towards our bodies. So for parents to really figure out how to manage their anxiety around food for themselves, but then also to have that very neutral, safe, playful, fun atmosphere at the dinner table, you're really helping kids have a much more balanced relationship with their bodies, which is very key as far as prevention of eating disorders. What's so important is if we focus on the um, connection between the parents and children at the table, as opposed to absolutely, the food. and I, I was just thinking, you know, when you're highlighting about anxiety, it really makes me think of, you, you know, people's personalities, people, the way people's nervous systems are wired when they come here. Oftentimes, that's reflected in how people eat. So, if you have a kid that's a, a little more of an anxious kid, um, warms up slower to new situations, most likely that is the child that is is a pickier eater, quote unquote, pickier eater, right? They're, they're not someone who, uh, there's someone who needs to see foods many times before they try it. And those are the kids who are probably getting pressured to eat, right? And so then we've got someone who's already an anxious, 
um, person who's getting more pressure and that anxiety is going up and that just doesn't work. So if you're at home thinking, yeah, but my kid's pretty picky and really doesn't eat any fruits and vegetables, that actually might be the child that really needs that structure and, and to really see that food over and over and see you eat it. And that's the path to them accepting it. I feel like that's the statement where light bulbs and people listening are going to be like, whoa, okay. That's because I think that's so helpful to recognize that like, yes, our kids just have their own personalities and our our own personalities are being projected onto them. And all we really want is the best for them. But sometimes our internalized pressure that we're putting onto them is not really mixing well with their true personality. And then it can be affecting how they eat, how they trust their body, all these things. So I think that that was such a great point. I, I'm thinking like, okay, we're all professionals here. We're recognizing that we understand this information. We teach people it for a living. I feel like I talk about it so much. And then when we go to apply it to our own lives, we recognize the challenges and whatnot. So what can you share to the parents listening that are or aren't professionals and how they can support themselves so that they ultimately are not passing or projecting these ideas onto their kids? I would say, I mean, a few things, right? They can reach out to, for, for resources like your podcast um, or our, the, the work that Anna and I do on Sunny Side Up Nutrition, books like Born to Eat, right? So really looking for um, uh, providers who are grounded in, uh, firmly grounded in health at every size and um, raising, well, not raising, but um, uh, continuing to let their children who are born intuitive, all kids are born intuitive eaters to continue to allow that to happen. I'm not saying that correctly. Responsive <laughs> feeders, right? Responsive feeders practitioners. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, um, I, I think Anna mentioned some of these things earlier, right? Modeling, right? Trusting themselves, working on their own relationships with food, their own relationship with food. If it is, you know, if it's been a struggle for them prior to having kids, um, Anna, what would you, I know you'll have lots of things to add. Gosh, I think all of those are great. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, as parents, we need somewhere to talk about our anxieties and worries. And so to really think about that, you know, do, do you have a, a trusted friend? Do you need a therapist? Um, a, a, a clinician that you can say, I'm really worried about this. And how, how is the best way to approach this situation? I feel like that's really important for parents to have the support um, if they can to kind of seek that out. Um, I would add, you know, tr trusting parents, trust yourselves, you know, your kids. Um, and also the more parents can do to be mindful of their own thoughts and beliefs about food and practice just being neutral and, and not voicing every thought that we have um, <laughs> about what our kids are or aren't eating. Yeah, it's information overload if they actually tap into our, our brains. I, I love the idea of just resources, right? I always use this as, as we're learning this process, it's like learning a new language. So at first it's going to be really overwhelming. There's going to be so much information and so much quote unquote memorization, right? Like I'm just learning vocab. I don't even know what I'm saying. And then eventually you're kind of regurgitating some phrases and eventually it kind of becomes second nature. So when it comes with something like this, it's like, if you can have those resources like really helpful Instagram accounts or free support groups or getting in, if that privilege is there to work with an individual, um, then just getting that 
really wholehearted support so that it's a place that you can start hearing this dialogue, hearing these phrases, and then ultimately regurgitating to your kids until eventually you're believing it for yourself and trusting in it yourself. So I think that that's such a helpful tip. Rachel, you have anything? I think, yeah. yeah, I think Elizabeth brings up a really good point, which is that every person and every child is so nuanced. And so trying to trust yourself and trust your child, you know, there is that point where you know that your kid has sensory processing issues or they're sensory avoidant. And so their relationship with food might look different than your other child. And so you're going to have to surrender a lot of the rule-based thinking and the rigidity and just trust that this is their child's own process. And I think when it becomes um, teenagers and parenting teenagers, and there's a whole nother level that parents have to go through because now they're trying to figure out, well, can I just trust my kid to go out and eat by themselves all the time? Or does this child have some other anxieties or OCDs or um, a peer group that's not supportive? And I actually need to be a little bit more involved and have some conversation. So really, I think trusting your own intuition as a parent, if you can do that work yourself, you're able to tap into that much more clearly without the diet culture. And then you're able to potentially guide your specific child. So I think that was my, my I liked that Elizabeth brought up that point is a lot of it is you know you take in all the resources and then you also filter what works for you and your family yeah so you bring up such a good point Rachel of like okay there are going to be conversations that you need to have with your kid right we're taking in this information but then we have to recognize that there's an actual human with their own personality and own preferences sitting in front of us so what would you guys recommend for parents on how you would have this conversation in a kid-friendly way or really tailoring it to be specific to their child? Well, some, something Elizabeth and I talk a lot about is um, really talking to children about nutrition in a developmentally appropriate way, excuse me, a developmentally appropriate way. So thinking about their age really does, um, needs to play a role in how we talk to kids about nutrition. We know that young children, um, you know, el- Element, mid elementary and down are real concrete thinkers. You know, they're going to take things so concretely, which Tina is what you brought up at the very beginning. You know, that we're going to say one thing and it, they cannot see that nuance of nutrition. Um, middle school and up, they can start to understand a bit more about that nuance. And so when I'm talking to younger children about nutrition, it does need to be a bit um, more concrete, but without that fear that we've been talking about. Um, something that came to mind was, you know, with, with my children, of course, they're hearing these messages at school and from their friends. And so they'll come home with these questions. And um, I remember my daughter was quite a bit younger. She said, you know, um, Mrs. So-and-so said that cookies are bad for you and they're going to make me sick. Um, you know, is that true, mommy? And I said, um, you know, well, let's, let's talk about that. Um, you know, it, and what we talked about was if we only ate one thing, we're, it's not going to be, uh, our bodies aren't going to like that, right? So if we only ate apples, we're going to quote unquote get sick, or that's not going to be a, a good idea. If we only ate cookies, we're going to miss out on some really important nutrition. And so, you know, as long as we're eating a variety of food and you know what, mommy and daddy have that covered. You don't need to worry about that. You're seeing all the variety of food and she'll still repeat that. She'll still, she's 14 and she'll still say, you know, if I only ate apples, that would not be good for me. You know, when she hears somebody say, you know, X, X food is not good for you. And so, but that was really concrete, but I had to think, okay, how am I going to explain this in a concrete way for a young, I think she was maybe five or six. Um, but they- Versus saying, no, cookies aren't bad for you. Exactly. Bye. Right. <laughs> We're like, okay, what do I do with that? Why did right? this teacher yeah. who I love say that? I don't understand. Uh-huh. Right. Right. Uh-huh. Or my mom saying the opposite. Who the heck right. do I trust? Right. Now, now I don't trust my teachers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I said to her, nutrition is confusing. You're going to hear messages like that all the time. And I'm so glad you could ask me that question. And we'll keep talking about it because it's really confusing. Certainly, I think if you know, with with teenagers, you might initiate a conversation if they're you know, um, going off to a sports activity, right? Or they have a long day at school and you want to make, well, 
nobody's lots of people aren't going to school right now and then off to a sports activity because right we're, <laughs> some are some are but here we're not but um you know you you want to help we want as anna said earlier our goal is to raise a, raise kids into adults who are able to feed themselves right um and so we might say have you if they're leaving the house and they're in charge of that day maybe taking grabbing snacks for themselves right you might say oh make sure to pick something that will fuel you through x until you know you get home at seven o'clock and have dinner kind of thing right so that's that's initiating a conversation um and you might initiate a conversation with a little with a well i'll let anna take the the really young children since she has young kids still and is works you know has written nutrition curriculum for young kids for preschoolers i think mostly the i think modeling is the best way for young kids to learn i think the times i i may have initiated might be when something really was said in front of me and i kind of saw a child's reaction and i might say hey do you want to talk about what you know sally's mom said at the birthday party and they might say no, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> um, you know, but that would probably be the only time that I might, if I something really blatantly was said that was contrary to how we talk about food, I might bring it up. Um, but otherwise, I would say more often it would be them um, allowing them to ask those questions, just like I think is the advice on so many topics about parenting. Wait for them to ask the questions, answer the questions and kind of move on from there. Yeah, I have so many individuals that I'm working with right now who have now become their parents and now are teachers and they're recognizing, oh my gosh, my kid is learning such whack nutrition information and they're having to answer these really challenging questions, right? Like, well, this assignment says that sugar is bad, is it not, right? And then them really having to open up this discussion around that sugar is not bad and let's talk about that and and just giving education so these parents that I'm working with are now becoming dietitians, dietetic teachers, you know, and so I think that outside of that, yeah, it, waiting for that child to bring it to you um, and just supporting really neutral based information, the healthy, not healthy, the good, the bad. You're literally planting in these seeds and just continuing that legacy of diet, uh, dieting. So really keeping it neutral. Absolutely. I love that. And keeping yes. weight out of it, right? <laughs> yeah. That's a whole nother topic. But yeah. really, whole nother thing. Really, mm -hmm. you know, keeping yeah. comments about weight totally out of it. Um, just, just neutral comments about food. In their podcast, Study Side Up Nutrition, all of you interviewed your children about the messages that they receive on their podcast. So we'll link that for you all to check out. But I thought it was interesting to hear both of your daughters discuss like the posters that are up in their school and the conversations that are happening in their health classes. And I'm curious to go along with the same question. Did they come home and say, mom, what about this poster? Or did you initiate, hey, what are you learning about food in high school these days? Or what's the messaging in the cafeteria? Because I think for teens, they're getting bombarded way more than young kids. And they're making their own decisions. And they're also just way less communicative with their parents. So <laughs> I was curious, I was curious how those conversations kind of went down in your homes. You know, I think, um, at least my memory is that they, um, one of the posters actually that my daughter mentioned in, that that ellie mentioned in the podcast my two daughters but that my middle schooler mentioned i hadn't heard about before but but both of my kids do come home and and report um not everything that they're learning in nutrition but um things you know that really stand out to them um, they're like they're like the nutrition police like mom <laughs> i heard this at school right. right like what do you think right like, getting you all fired up to write a letter exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how my kid's gonna be i can picture it he's like coming home like mom this is what they said I'm like, 
let's get him, dude. What, what, right, what? Right, right. Um, and someone actually, I will say about the letter writing. Now I'm going off on a tangent. Anna and I just Please, interviewed yes. someone. Uh, uh, the the episode's not live yet, but she talked about thinking about um, teachers and administration and the schools as our partners, as opposed to our. So then, because my reaction is always just kind of, oh my gosh, I can't believe they are saying this, right? Um, and that puts the the person on the receiving end on their back on their heels. But anyway, back to the back to the the question at hand is, you know, how did we um, how did those conversations come up? And as a, in my house, primarily they come up with them bringing re reporting. Same at my house. So I think my 14 year old in the podcast talked about a, a poster in the gym. And I remember when she came home, she was very upset about it. So it was, it was a poster that said, I'm summarizing, but the health consequences of the O word. I don't know if y'all, what your rules are in your podcast about um, yeah. the O word. <laughs> o -word. And it, there was a picture, like a cartoon picture. And then all of these, you know, words coming off from each body part of what the health consequences Ugh. are. And, and, and she oh said, my. mom, what if you're about, you know, what if one of the children look at that and their body looks at that, looks like that? What if their parents' bodies look like that? You know, she, um, it was like horrifying to her. Um, and so, you know, we talked about it and, um, and that was maybe two years ago. And so it was, it was interesting to me that when we interviewed them, it was like the first thing on her mind. Um, that it's really kind of stuck. It oh, did disappear nice. after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your letter must have been effective. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. The call, I like the calling in, right? We're like, these are allied professionals. They're ultimately like second parents to our kids. Like, thank you, teachers, so much. And they didn't go to school to teach nutrition, right? So they're just regurgitating, they're doing what we were taught. And yet they didn't get the counseling piece. So I think calling everyone in, meaning let's have a conversation. Let's give some education. Let me fill you in on my philosophy and why I believe this information is harmful and the conversations that I'm having with my kids. And most often I feel like teachers are really receptive. Um, and also maybe like, I can't change the curriculum. This is what the state gives me that I have to teach. And now we're talking about a systemic issue. So, so any, this has been amazing. I feel like this is a lot of really helpful information. And again, we're just scraping the surface, busting this myth that is massive. So we've busted a myth that probably could take years and years to talk about in about 30 minutes. So go you guys. Um, but is there anything else you want to add or resources you want to share? I just think if parents can remember to keep in mind to back to the trusting themselves, right? And trust if the parents are doing their job of offering, that allows the child to do their job of eating and deciding whether or not they're even going to try the vegetables or fruits. I, I just, I think that's so true. And that, you know, probably if I had to add to a take home message is just that, that, that um, anxiety is kind of comes from our culture onto the parent and then the parent goes to the child. So we can, as parents, we can be kind of the um, point in that chain that it, um, we break that um, if, and we can surround ourselves, hopefully um, we can seek out some resources. And like you said, um, if with privilege, seek out some other ways of support. Um, to try to break that chain because um, it, it's such a cycle, you know, that pressure. Well, yeah. where can people find you? I know there's multiple spots, so fill us in. <laughs> well, um, you can find us at sunnysideupnutrition.com. That's where you can find uh, our blog and Elizabeth posts wonderful, very easy recipes um, and we also write blog posts about family feeding, like we've been talking about today. Um, we, um, you can find us on Instagram, which is at Sunnyside Up Nutritionists, and um, our podcast, which um, you can find on your podcast app and also on our website. What did I miss, Elizabeth? 
Oh, we're also on Facebook at Sunnyside Up Nutritionists and Pinterest. Whoa. Although I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> well, y'all are awesome. Thank you. Thank you for chatting with us. Yay. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Thank, yes. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. That is a wrap on this episode of the Mythbuster series, and we hope this information provides you with a more critical lens when you hear mainstream diet culture messaging. Please reach out to the person interviewed to connect with them in the ways they listed, or you can check out our social media pages at Mom Jeans the Podcast for details on the episode and to find our guests' information. And if you love the episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes and recommend this episode to a friend. Sending you the inner strength to accept your jeans with a G and wear the jeans with a J. Bye. This episode of Mom Jeans was produced and edited by Rachel Coleman and Tina LeBoy. Just a reminder, this episode is not a substitute for therapeutic counsel or nutrition advice. Thank you to Jerry DePizzo for the music production. You can find episode information and show notes at www.momjeansthepodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at momjeansthepodcast and join the Mom Jeans the Podcast Facebook group to find a community of mamas learning to love their bodies and discussing the episodes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mom Jeans. See you next time.